Field will defend his title against Larry Holmes June 19th at Caesars Palace. And the 42-year-old Holmes was probably around when Caesar was fighting Mark Anthony. <laughs> Thursday in New York, they officially announced their uh, big bout. Larry Holmes, who played the professor, dissecting Holyfield with visual aids. Holyfield, more conservatively attired, explains why Holmes gets the shot. A lot of the young heavyweight wreck today is fighting people with no name and thinking that this is what going to get them the opportunity. Larry Holmes stepped up to the plate and fought Ray Mercer. A great champion. Look at that physique. Strong. But where is he making a mistake? Look where his hands at. <laughs> Larry, I'll tell you something. I was watching you up there. You were great up there. I'm telling you, you know, I guarantee you're going to be the class Victor Vitor or Valeradian or something like that. You're going, to, you're going to wind up doing something. I know you're not good. <laughs> All right, so Dubas, no uh, Phi Beta Kappa. Ruggedly handsome, I think, describes Lou Duva. Very rugged. 1978 until September of 1985, Larry Holmes was the undefeated heavyweight champion of the world. His reign was the longest since Joe Lewis's, and his string of 48 straight victories was only one short of Rocky Marciano's all-time heavyweight record. This June, at the age of 42, 14 years after he beat Ken Norton for the heavyweight title, Holmes is fighting for it again against Evander Holyfield. Good evening. Welcome to Shap Talk in our new Tuesday night niche. I'm Dick Shap, and Larry Holmes, as you can tell, is our guest tonight. If you'd like to talk to the former heavyweight champion of the world, call us at 1-800-831-ESPN. That's 1-800-831-ESPN. Larry, why? Why? You have a family, you have money, you have property. You saw George Foreman's face the other night. Why risk it? Well, first of all, George fight was because of style. And when he had the guy in trouble, he had a little sentiment in his heart, and he, let, he did not let the punches go. As far as I'm concerned, this is a great opportunity for me to put another chapter in the book. I can be the heavyweight champion of the world again. I've seen it. All my predictions have come true. I fought the best young heavyweight out there in Ray Mercer, and now I got a chance to fight the heavyweight champion of the world, Evander Holyfield. And I know on June the 19th, I will be the new heavyweight champion of the world. The new and the old heavyweight champion. And the old heavyweight, the Both. grandfather of the champion. <laughs> <laughs> Both of the same. When, when, when the idea first presented itself to you, how did it germinate? Well, where did it begin? Well, it began, you know, almost like a George Foreman coming back and beating these guys and saying, if he can do it, I can do it. But I wasn't quite ready yet because I knew it was a couple obstacles I would have to jump above. And that was my, one of them was Mike Tyson. So as Mike Tyson starts slipping, I says, I can come back now because Mike is losing it, losing it fast. So I, I came back and I started working, fighting the guys like the George Foreman was fighting and seeing that I had the opportunity to become the champion. The money, obviously, is very big, much bigger than... a very important part. It does play an important part. Yeah. I mean, there, there's... No, no matter how much you've earned and how right. much you've invested and so right. on, it never hurts to have another seven million. That's right. I yeah. can understand that. Well, you know, I wouldn't do it for free, Dick. I <laughs> no. Mean... No, this year for free, but not, <laughs> this not, is for free. Not, not taking a punch. Let's see if we can take our, our first call tonight. Uh, go ahead. You have, a, you have a question for Larry Holmes? In Whitman, Massachusetts, do you have a question for Larry? Um, yeah, Larry. Yes. Um, I, I was wondering, I watched, um, I watched you fight with, <laughs> with uh, Eddie Gonzalez, and uh, a afterwards you attacked Trevor Burbick. What was going on there? Well, the Burbick situation is a dead issue. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> it is. A, he's in trouble, I noticed. Uh, he's... Well, a guy like Burbick probably would stay in trouble, and one of the things that he's done is got me aroused enough to, um, to put me in the, that position, mm -hmm. and I kind of regret that I, I got myself into that because mm -hmm. that would never happen again if I had a chance to think about it. But uh, mm -hmm. Burbank is something that's out of my system, out of my mind. I got a life to live, and yeah. I want to live it the best I can. I kind of feel sorry for him right now. Let me. Here we have another phone call. Uh, go ahead. Do you have a question for Larry? Yes, uh, Larry. Yes. Uh, what was your opinion of the Holyfield Foreman? Uh, Holyfield. I'm sorry, Stuart Foreman fight. Uh, when he fought Alex Stewart, I thought George fought a good fight early. Uh, George have a tendency of not doing the things that he normally would do. Get you hurt, he got a tendency of laying back and let you survive. You got to take these guys out of you, out of there, because uh, George still the same. George Foreman still gets tired after four or five rounds, 
And uh, if you don't get those guys out of there, he's vulnerable to get, you know, get hit, and that's what happened. We'll be back with Larry Holmes and with more of your phone calls after these messages. Shop Talk is brought to you by Bud Dry. Dry brewed so it drinks light, yet satisfies completely. back with the once and perhaps future king of the heavyweights, Larry Holmes, the slightly elderly uh, Eastern assassin. Larry, to me, the greatest fight that you ever fought was in October 1980 against Muhammad Ali. He was at the end of his career. You, you could have hurt him. You could have punished him. You didn't. Why? Well, he's, he was always an idol of mine. He was a friend of mine. And uh, I knew that Ali didn't have anything. And that's one of the reasons why I left him in 1975. Uh, when he fought Chuck Webner. I was really doing real well working with Muhammad Ali as a sparring partner. So I really knew him, and I, I was just honored just to get the opportunity to say I'm fighting a great fighter. That's great. Let, let's take a phone call from Tony in Leo Minster, Massachusetts. Tony, you have a question for Larry? Yes, hi, Larry. I just, hi. I'd like to wish you luck against Evanda. Thank you very much, Tony. Okay, my question is, uh, do you think boxing will be a better sport without Don King? <laughs> no, I think you need Don King. You need a, a good guy. You need a bad guy in all business. And Don you King. You mean there's no other bad guys? <laughs> there's a lot of bad guys in boxing, but Don King is just a guy who thinks that he's doing what he has to do to protect his fighter or his interests or whatever. And you know, I don't. I can't point a stick at Don and say he's a bad boy. I can't say he's a good boy. Don King is Don King. What more can I say? <laughs> you, you've had your good moments with him. And I had my your, good moments and I had my bad moments. And I your mean, bad moments. We both made a lot of money together, <laughs> and uh, I might have made more money without him. But, hey, you know, you learn these things after, you know, it's too late sometimes. Yeah, he's going to be on with us next week, and I'm, mm -hmm. I'm sure he will have lots of big words to say about you. <laughs> well, uh, I hope he cuts them down so I can understand a few. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get... Uh, Brandon from Columbus, uh, Kansas. Brandon, you have a question for Larry Holmes? Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, hi, Larry. How you doing? I just wondered, who was your idol when you were a kid? Well, you know, I had two idols. First the idol was Joe Lewis, and then my father. My father was my first idol, then Joe Lewis, and, uh, you know, I took it on from there. With Lewis, uh, he was at the end of his career, really, uh, when, when you were old enough yeah. to follow boxing. How did you learn about him? Well, you know, my mother used to always turn that radio on. Uh, Joe Lewis was very big back then, and uh, everybody talked about Joe Lewis. And one of the great things that happened to me in this boxing game is that I got the chance to meet Joe Lewis and be with him and did a lot of things with him. That was like, hey, a dream come true to me. That, 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 that's true. What did your father do? If he was my father was a sharecropper, sure. but he, we moved here to Connecticut, and then he worked landscaping, and then he built buildings and um, construction sites and whatnot. Later on, to go back to what you said about Ali, I mean, he was sort of a hero, too. Mm -hmm. and, and you worked for him. That, that was a, it was a different mm -hmm. day. I, I can't imagine, yeah. you know, fighters don't learn that way anymore, do they? Well, Muhammad gave me an opportunity to learn. He gave me an opportunity to be a sparring partner. He gave me an opportunity to travel with him, to see how he act, to do the things that he'd done. And, you know, from all of the experiences that he was going through at that time, I was learning from those things. So if I ever became the heavyweight champion, I know the good things to do and I know the bad things not to do. And, uh, you know, as far as I'm concerned, Ali was one of the great fighters of all time. And he certainly was a, a friend of mine, still is. And uh, I still look up to him. I, I still would, you know, grab him, hug him. and because uh, he was a great human being. And, and you also sparred with Joe Frazier and, and got lessons from him, too. Joe Frazier has always been a good guy, and he's still a good guy. As a matter of fact, I've come in contact with Joe more than I do any other fighter out there. If Joe needs something from Larry Holmes, he calls Larry, can you come here? I'm in my car going to Joe Frazier because uh, he's a good guy. I mean, he, he goes out and helps these young kids. He's boxing. forgiven you for what you did to his son? He's he forgiven me because he knew <laughs> he don't know it was business. Like when he broke my ribs, I mean, I had Just a me. <laughs> I said, damn, Joe, I said, you hit too hard, man. Take it easy. He said, it's business, Larry. But you just, yeah, just one thing, though. I mean, after you beat a vendor, you're not going to fight Joe. No, I'm going to look for Ali. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's take another call from Phil in Queens, New York. Phil, go ahead. Uh, thank you for having me on. Um, my question is to um, the one and only 
Larry Holmes. Thank you. Held a belt for seven years. That's a lot. Not too many fighters these days are doing that at all. And uh, I do think you're worthy. But my question is, why do you think that uh, Riddick Bowe and the other young Tigers, young Lions, are not getting the chance that they should get from Evander Holyfield? Well, one of the things that these young Lions, or you call them, are not getting the chance because they won't fight nobody. Uh, Ray Mercer, he took a chance and he fought me. He lost, so he set him back a little bit. But he's one guy that they should be trying to challenge to say, hey, I'm worthy of a, uh, the opportunity to fight for the title. They won't fight each other. They won't do nothing but sit on TV and talk about so-and-so won't give me a shot. One of the bad things with managers, they run to the Olympics and they get these guys out and get them signing contracts and then they sit them on a shelf and not let them fight anybody until they get a big payday to fight for their title. And then they got all the investment back. If you want a fighter to be a good fighter, he's got to go to school to learn how to be it. You just can't learn sitting on the shelf fighting guys that can't fight. And this is what these guys are doing. Nobody's learning the way you guys used they, to. They're, you would not have heard of these guys at all if they was around with the Muhammad Ali, the Joe Frazier, the Ken Norton, the Ron Chirallo, the Jerry Corey's, I mean, the Ostevano Venus. I can keep on going. If those guys were all still around, you wouldn't have made a comeback. I would not have made a comeback. <laughs> okay, let's take another call from Joe in Brownsville, New Jersey. Joe, you have a question for Larry. Yes, uh, Larry, what makes you think you can come back against Holyfield when you were beat so bad by Mike Tyson? Well, it's a different fighter, different style. Mike Tyson is a little short guy, strong, come back, swinging. And Larry Holmes was off for two and a half years and tried to make that comeback. You can't do it, especially at the age that I am. Uh, with Vander Holyfield, I've been training now, getting ready for him for 14 months. I have fought in five, six, six fights, and I'm pretty, pretty much ready for Vander Holyfield. The question is, he's not really, he haven't really went to school. Who did he ever beat? Look at it. Look at his record. Check it out. He really haven't beat anybody to become the heavyweight champion. He beat the overweight Buster Douglas that got $24 million and laid down. Uh, but Larry Holmes, I'm too legit to quit. So, you know, we're going to have a good fight on June the 19th in Las Vegas. And don't be like all the critics saying that I'm too old, my legs is going to go on me. Don't breathe that. I'm knocking this boy out. Too legit to quit. You're going to sing, too, and rap for yeah, us. I'm gonna rap. <laughs> <laughs> Let us take a break. After a peek at Larry Holmes through the years. Shaft Talk with Larry Holmes, who is training to fight Evander Holyfield for some $7 million, a slight increase since his boxing debut, and for the heavyweight championship that once belonged to Larry. Our phone number is 1-800-831-ESPN, and it's time for us to take a call from Dan in Andover, Massachusetts. Dan, do you have a question for Larry? Yes. I'd like to uh, wish you luck against uh, Holyfield. Thanks, Dan, and we want, want to see you at ringside. Yes, and uh, I want to know what do you think about uh, Mike Tyson and his situation? Well, I think he's uh, in a, a bad situation. <clears throat> I just wish him luck. I say a prayer for him and hope that everything turn out for him. But that's about, about the best that I can, you know, say right now. Mm -hmm. it, it certainly was, was not much fun to watch him going through what he went through and seeing the sport go through what it went through. Does, does it stain every boxer when someone goes through something you know, like that? People are always trying to put emphasis on boxers. And boxers don't do it. The, the boxer do it himself. So the game is great. It's always going to be a great game. And if one person get in trouble, that's that one person. Uh, I don't think Mike Tyson did anything intentionally, if he did anything at all. Um, you know, what we've got to do is learn to forget and forgive. And if a person needs help, help them. And I think that makes us better people if we can just do that. I, like I said, I wish him the best. I hope he comes out of this thing okay. And I hope that they don't give him no more than he needs. I hope he 
Mm -hmm. It's clear upstairs and come on out and knock out some more people. I think it's very hard to, to judge whether or not he did something with neither of us we having been there. Right. But, but, but I do hope that, that somehow he comes through this and comes out a, a exactly. better person. Let's take another call from, I think it's uh, Marty in, in Lake Charles, Louisiana. Marty, do you have a question for Larry? Uh, yeah, hi, Larry. Hi, Marty. How are you? I'm fine. I was just uh, wondering if you would like your children to be involved in professional boxing. I would like my son to be a manager and my <laughs> uh, and my daughter to be the promoter. <laughs> to keep it in the family that way. But um, I'm working so hard for both of all my family, and um, I don't think they have to go through what I'm going through. I think once is, one is enough, and I just want them to get what I didn't get a proper education and a lot of learning, and uh, and do with do with that. How old is your oldest son? My oldest son is only nine. Only but nine I, years. But I got daughters that are older than that. I'm, I'm a grandfather, as you know. I know. I can see. <laughs> see the <laughs> wrinkles in my eyes? <laughs> wow. The, the, the nine-year-old son, does he box? Does he, he pull around? He, no, he takes karate. He does the karate at Red Dragon School there in Easton. And my daughter, she likes to truly. She does everything. But, uh, you know, um, whatever he wants to do. Uh, uh, you know, I'm not going to tell him what to do and what not to do. Basketball. Do it. That's if that's what he wants to do, <laughs> I help him play that. Okay. Yeah. Let's take a call from Shell in Sacramento. Go ahead, Shell. Larry. Yes. It's a great pleasure to talk to a champion like you. Thank you very much. I'd like to ask you, are you afraid at all of hanging on too long in your career and ending up like Ali is right now? No. Whatever's going to happen to me is going to happen. I leave that in God's hands. I just feel like that I can go a little bit, and I want to try to get my championship uh, back, championship belt back, which is a lot of times when you lose something, you don't get it back. And I would like to get it back, you know, before the year is out, and that's going to be June, and defend it one time and, and retire from there. You know, I, I mentioned before the way George got beat up the other night, and obviously, you know, we're all saddened by sure. what, what has happened to Ali. Is there a fear at all ever that, that you know, something really bad could happen? It's a fear sometimes when I'm riding down the street. Mm -hmm. So it's always a fear when I go out into that boxing ring. Uh, we never know what's gonna happen from one minute or to the next. Uh, I'm doing what I was taught to do early in my life, and I feel that I'm doing it the best way I can do it. I feel that I'm the best in my field. And um, so I don't fear it as damn I'm gonna get hurt because I'd never be able to perform properly if I did that. Yeah. I mean, you look and you sound healthy, and I just want you to stay that way. I want everyone well, to stay I, that way. Oh, I feel good, you know. I feel real good about the way I am and, and my health and everything like that. So I'm, I'm okay, Dad. We've got a phone call now from your hometown, from Eastern Pennsylvania, East. from Brent. Is that a close friend? Brent, uh, you have a question for your neighbor? Yeah, I do. Larry. Hi, Brent. Hey, we're all behind you, Larry. Thank you. Okay, hey, what do you think your greatest fight was? Uh, I got to go back to 1978, June 9th. That's when I fought Kenny Norton. That was a tough fight. At that time, there was a lot of animosity in the fight game, and managers and promoters were uh, promoting a fight like we hated each other, and, and it turned out that uh, we hated each other, but we really didn't. But Kenny Norton was one of my toughest fights, and believe me, uh, I don't want to think about that fight. <laughs> You see his son playing now in the his National Football League? His son plays football for Dallas Cowboys, and uh, this, that's great. God, he must have been a lot older than you, Kenny. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, we will take a break, and we'll return with Larry Holmes after these messages. Shaft Talk with the heavyweight contender and former champion, Larry Holmes. We'll go straight to the phone. We have a phone call from Danny in Lafayette, Louisiana. Danny, what's your question for Larry? Uh, hi, Larry. Hi, Danny. How are you? Fine. How you doing, man? Good. Larry, uh, I remember I remember watching you in interviews and, and fighting back in the late 70s and early 80s, and it, it seemed like you always had something to say, like you always had an attitude. Watching you tonight seems like... Uh, seem like you've mellowed out a lot. Are you just uh, serious and down to business now? I just wondered, yeah. uh, just well, wondered why the change. Well, um, I'm serious. I'm down to business, but I'm mellow. Uh, and I think that comes with age. When you're young and you're the heavyweight champion of the world and, and people are all grabbing on you and telling you how great you is, I think you do get a little cocky. 
And I think that's probably what happened to me. But I'm just um, happy that I'm still, you know, I still got my feet on the ground and I can see it, things a lot, lot clearer now than I did then. So I think that makes me a better person. I think that would make me a better fighter. And uh, I'm happy with myself. How much of that edge was the fact that in those days you were constantly being compared to Ali? Oh, man, every time you turn around, it was being compared to somebody, you know, and sometimes that makes you kind of mad. Like now I'm kind of angry because I was expecting a lady to call me from Jacksonville. Her name is Myrna, and she didn't call me, so I'm kind of mad at that. I mean, <laughs> she looks out for me down there at my house and stuff, and she didn't call. I don't know if the guys put her through or not, but Myrna, I'm going to get you. And she's supposed to call the show. Yeah. Oh, to ask you how your house is. Yeah. Okay. We have, we have, uh, let, let's take our next call. I, I don't think it's from Myrna. It's, it's from Gary. Oh, Gary, you have a question for Larry Holmes? Uh, yeah, so I'd like to say good luck in Las Vegas. And um, I was wondering, do you want to fight Foreman? Oh, yeah, that would be that would be nice. That way Dick can come out and, you know, <laughs> and it's, it's back home week, you know, for the senior citizen. I think everybody would come out, Jack Nicholas and everybody would come out. I think it will be a great night at Caesars Palace or one of the hotels, uh, major hotels. Uh, uh, but first thing at first, I got to get by Holyfield and take his hat off like I know I can do. Holyfield knows it, and I want all y'all fans out there to know it. We, we have a phone call from Las Vegas. Go ahead. Hi, uh, Larry. Um, what do you think about uh, Sugar Ray's comeback? Sugar Ray Leonard? I don't know if he's coming back. <laughs> I, I, that's new to me, but if he comes back, I, you know, I wish him the best. And uh, I oh, think... oh I, guess, I guess the question was, what, what did you think about it when oh, he did the, make his comeback? Oh, when he made it. I thought it was great because the man was young. He had a lot of boxing ability. I think he, um, you know, did a lot for boxing game. And... Uh, I, and he made a lot of money, so anytime somebody can get out there and make some money to pay the rent, I think it's great. And if he wants to come back again, you're willing to fight him? I'm, I'm willing to fight him. <laughs> I'll fight my little son, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> you, 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 you and Foreman will be the start of the senior tour yeah. in boxing. And that's on, right. Only writers over 50 will, will well, be allowed to come. That's cover. right. To all them young writers, they got to go. Right, but you'll both bring your grandchildren into the we'll ring bring, with you. We'll bring our grandkids into the ring. <laughs> You know, it, we're laughing. Does it sound sort of funny to you? I mean, yeah, but, you know, it's not far-fetched from that, though. You know, it's, it's funny. It's a good idea. Uh, I think it, was, it would be great. It's amazing that you two guys never fought. Well, you know what happened with George? Um, <clears throat> I, when he was champion, I was right underneath him, and uh, he fought Jimmy Young. I fought on the same card. And right after he lost that fight, he came to me and said, don't fight anymore, Larry, because this is this and this is what. And uh, he retired. And, uh, but we always been friends ever since, and uh, we're still friends. That was the fight after which he had the, the visitation. The visitation. And, and, uh, and the visitation Somebody showed him Come the back light. when you were in your 40s. <laughs> <laughs> we will take one more break, and then we'll come back for a final few minutes with Larry Hall. Transportation provided by Daybell Limousine, serving you in over 350 cities worldwide. Hotel accommodations provided by the Lowe's New York Hotel, conveniently located in the heart of Manhattan. We are down to the final round with Larry Holmes, the quantum heavyweight champion of the world. That means former. <laughs> Where do you rank yourself among, among heavyweight champions? Well, I'm president today, guys. I, I rank myself number one. Would you? Yeah. Uh, you got to have that confidence. Of all the young guys, is there any one guy out there you like the best? Well, you know, uh, they're all good. But, you know, Bob Aaron would have to tell me who I should fight after I fight Evander Holyfield. Okay, as long as he gives you the check. That's right. <laughs> Larry, next week when, when uh, Don King's here, we'll, we'll ask him some of the same questions. We'll yeah. try to put him on the spot. Tell him I wish him the best. <laughs> <laughs> I will tell him that. Thank you, Larry Holmes, Thank for you. being with us tonight. Thanks to our viewers and to our callers. Next Tuesday, as I've mentioned, our guest will be the Tonsorial Tower of Babel, Mike Tyson's promoter, protector, and prolocutor, Don King. I'm using all his words. Tune in and call in at 7.30 Eastern Time here on ESPN. And don't forget to join Robin Roberts and me on Sunday Sports Day starting at 10 a.m. Eastern Time each Sunday. Thanks for being with us. Good night. Travel provided by Continental. One airline can make a difference. What's the difference? For unrestricted coach, a first-class seat, 
That's the difference on Continental. Commander Holyfield owns the belts that once were worn by Mike Tyson. Friday night, another former owner looks to reclaim those bejeweled symbols of heavyweight supremacy, Larry Holmes. 42 years of age, he challenges Holyfield and the calendar. Charlie Steiner is in Las Vegas at the beginning of a week that brings all sorts of interesting folk to town. Charles? Thank you, Robert, and welcome to Las Vegas Caesars Palace, where on Friday night, we'll get it on. Vander Holyfield and Larry Holmes for the heavyweight championship of the world. Holyfield worked out this morning in public over at the Sports Pavilion for about an hour, sparred a half a dozen rounds, not very hard rounds to be sure, but realistically speaking, by the time you reach Las Vegas, all the hard work is done. That's not to say he wasn't getting some coaching from his venerable trainer, George Benton. Indeed, he was. And while Holyfield was busy at work this morning, Larry Holmes was backstage, addressing a handful of media members, expressing no fear about Friday night's fight. Believe what I'm saying. I don't care what Holyfield does. It don't even bother me. It don't even say, I've been knocked down, I've been knocked out. What can he do to me? Kill me? He don't hit that hard. I see him beat up, wobbled around the ring a lot of times. It ain't nothing this man can do to me. That was Larry Holmes this morning. Larry Holmes at this minute is conducting his own public workout over at the Sports Pavilion. Coming up a little bit later on this edition of Sports Center, a Larry Holmes retrospective. A look back at his brilliant boxing career. That's it for us for now. Let's go back to Sports Center. Bob? All right, Charlie, today they train Wednesday. They are weighed. Heavyweights on the hoof. How much weight we find out at the weigh in live on Wednesday, Sports Center at 7 Eastern Time. Only Joe Lewis held the title longer. Larry Holmes has always been a curious sort, claiming that he was always fighting for respect. But with his record, 54 and 3, 37 knockouts, and that seven and a half year championship run, it's curious as to why he felt he needed that respect. He always got it in the ring. Larry Holmes was a perfect 29-0 before he was able to fight and win the heavyweight championship of the world 14 years ago last week. And despite injuring his left arm in training for that fight, he went the distance in one of the most thrilling fights of the 70s and won a close decision from Ken Norton. It was no turning me back. That's the introduction that I got when I fought Kenny Norton, the fight that I needed to, for people to realize I was legit and I could be the champion that I wanted to be. Holmes had been a sparring partner for Muhammad Ali in the mid-70s, then began a seven and a half year reign as a heavyweight champion of the world. Only Joe Lewis had a longer championship run. While the heavyweight roster in the late 70s and early 80s was generally considered thin, Holmes took on all comers. Was he one of the two or three great heavyweight champions of the 20th century? No. But that's, that's not to demean him in any way. In his time, in his prime, he beat everybody they put in front of him. He never ducked anyone. Uh, he beat everybody. He beat most of those guys, uh, the Bone Crusher Smiths and, and all the rest of them, decisively. Holmes defended his title 21 times. But there were three bouts that were especially memorable in his tenure with the title. October 2nd, 1980, when Holmes was in the unenviable position of having to beat up his idol, friend, and mentor of fading Muhammad Ali in a fight where Holmes would later admit he pulled his punches. A year and a half later, in one of the most eagerly anticipated championship fights of the 80s, Holmes TKO'd Jerry Cooney in the 13th round here at Caesars. It's always bothered Holmes that while he earned the largest paycheck of his career that night, $10 million, Cooney, the challenger, earned the exact same amount. September 21st, 1985, was a night that ended Holmes' reign as champion. He was attempting to equal Rocky Marciano's heavyweight record of winning his first 49 fights. But Michael Spinks won a controversial decision, and Holmes lost his composure after the fight. Rocky couldn't carry my jock strap. That's right. And I, I appreciate if Jerry Lister and anybody else who tried to run a computer fight to put the truth in the machine and not some fantasy thing because people want a white hope. There will never be a white champion as long as black fighters fighting the way they are. They wanted something to pounce on Larry Holmes about, and they did. They pounced on me. I look back at saying that and regretting and probably making an apology that I made because 
what I said was not, nothing in jest. It was just something that I said. And they took it and blew it out of proportion. Seven months later, Holmes would lose another decision to Spinks, and he would retire. But a year and a half later, Holmes would come back and be knocked out by Mike Tyson in just four rounds. After another three-year retirement, Holmes returned again, taking on five anonymous opponents, which led to his 12-round decision over Ray Mercer in February, which in turn led to what could be his last hurrah on Friday night. Our coverage of Larry Holmes and Evander Holyfield for their Friday Night Heavyweight Championship fight continues on SportsCenter at 11 o'clock Eastern time tonight. Well, Friday's the day heavyweight champ Evander Holyfield puts his titles on the line against former title holder Larry Holmes. Both fighters got in some ring work Monday, but Holmes seemed to get in some of his best shots in a ring of reporters. Charlie Steiner has those details, plus other news of the day from Las Vegas. <laughs> How you like that? I've been talking to the king. And then... Just another day at the office for 42-year-old Larry Holmes as he prepares for Friday night's heavyweight championship fight with Evander Holyfield. Holmes worked out today, sparred six rounds, his last public sparring prior to Friday night's fight. Fairly spirited rounds at that. On Monday morning, Evander Holyfield did likewise, sparring six rounds. Not really working terribly hard. Most of the hard work, of course, was done in Houston on his way to Las Vegas. He did spend some time, however, talking with his trainer, George Benton, getting some final pointers. While Holyfield was busy at work in the ring, Larry Holmes was busy at work talking to the media, professing no fear about the outcome of Friday night's fight. I don't care what Holyfield does. It don't even bother me. It don't even I've been knocked down. I've been knocked out. What can he do to me? Kill me? He don't hit that hard. I see him beat up, wobbled around the ring a lot of times. It ain't nothing this man can do to me. I went in the fight with cut eyes. I went in the, in the fight with one arm. I went in the fight with twist ankles. I went in the fight with one hand. My hands hurt. So what, what more can happen to me? You know, I feel the same way. It's, it's, you know, it really don't matter what he do. But 8 and 19, everybody get a chance to see what we both would do. I got a lot of reasons to win not only fighting for the title and getting seven million dollars but fighting for the title winning the seven uh, winning the title and getting seven million dollars and winning it at 42 years old defending it at 43 years old i mean you know it, uh, don't you know i'll be 43 years old when i defend my title against george foreman a 44 year old man <laughs> man that's this is history or it could be ancient history if Larry Holmes pulls off the upset here on Friday night, his first challenger would be George Foreman, November 13th, here at Caesars Palace in Las Vegas, in what they might bill as the Battle of the Bulge. Coming up at the 7 o'clock Eastern Time edition of Sports Center here on Tuesday, we'll take a look at the brief reign of Evander Holyfield's heavyweight championship run. For now, Charlie Steiner, ESPN at Caesars Palace in Las Vegas. Let's go back to Sports Center. And if you're in the mood to handle a couple of weighty issues, then turn into ESPN at 7 Eastern Time Wednesday night for live coverage of the Holmes Holyfield weigh-in. Heavyweight champions battle it out in Las Vegas. Savander Holyfield and Larry Holmes up close. Evander Holyfield has been the undisputed heavyweight champion of the world for 20 months. He's never lost a professional fight. But Holyfield still searches for the respect given to heavyweight champions. Critics believe that Holyfield has had too difficult a time in his last two title defenses. Evander went the distance last year with a 42-year-old George Foreman in a fight many felt Holyfield would easily win. Six months later, Burt Cooper, yeah, Burt Cooper knocked Holyfield down before Holyfield came back to regain his title in the seventh round. Holyfield's emergence to greatness may have come in a scheduled fight with former champ Mike Tyson last January, but the heavily anticipated match was first postponed and then, of course, canceled when Tyson was injured and later convicted for the rape of Desiree Washington. So, the jury is still out on whether or not Holyfield is the real deal. 
this Friday night from Caesars Palace in Las Vegas, a fight telecast and pay-per-view, the champ will again take on a member of boxing's senior division, the 42-year-old Larry Holmes. The former champs won six fights in his comeback, including one over unbeaten former Olympic gold medalist Ray Mercer. Today, from Las Vegas, we'll talk to both boxers about the upcoming fight and the events which have clouded boxing over the past few months. The challenger, Larry Holmes, the champion, Evander Holyfield. Today, up close. Now joining us up close, here is the champion of the world, Evander Holyfield from Las Vegas, fighting Friday night against Larry Holmes. Welcome, Evander. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Let's talk a little bit about uh, this point, that this fight really doesn't do boxing any good. That's not my words. Those are the words of a lot of boxing analysts and uh, people who really feel that it's just for the big payday for both of you guys, but it really doesn't help the sport. What do you think, Evander? Well, um, people really have to look at it as uh, I'm following the rules of regulation, and uh, I'm the champion of the world, and I have to face all challenges. And I was put in a position to fight the winner of Ray Mercer and Larry Holm. Larry Holm won the fight, so I have to keep the agreement to fight Larry Holm. If Ray Mercer won the fight, it would have been no problem. But I can't deny Larry Holm this opportunity. Would you admit that the fans are beginning a little, getting a little turned off now of the seniors tour in boxing? That maybe they want to see some of the young fighters and the quote more legitimate fighters not to knock george foreman or larry holmes that people really want to see the future of boxing not something that's going to be around for maybe another year well patient is very important um larry holmes is and and george foreman just having to be on two recognized uh, fighter for what they have done the young um, up-and-coming heavyweights haven't got the opportunity to proving himself by the exposure and people not willing to go out and pay the big bucks to see them right now at this point in time. What about the point that says, uh, and we've talked about it before, we talk about, talk about it with Lou Duva later on this week, that uh, you guys are really ducking Riddick Bowe. Rock Newman says that's the, the case, uh, that they, they wanted to have this fight and you guys passed on it. Well, Riddick Bowe is not ranked number one. Uh, I was ranked number one for two years and didn't get the opportunity, but I was patient enough to wait till the opportunity came. Me following the rules and regulation, uh, my next fight would probably be against Coaster, but Ray Mercer's fighting Coaster, and I have to fight the winner of Coaster and Ray the Bow. Mm -hmm. If Ray the if Ray the Bow lose, then I end up fighting Coaster, and people don't even know Coaster. Right. So the same point will be made again. Yeah. What about the steroid controversy? Larry Holmes said at one point early on in the press conference said that everyone knows, quote unquote, that Evander Holyfield has used steroids for years. Uh, and then of course, your personal fitness trainer took out a full page ad of the USA Today, Mr. Jordan, saying that that is not just outrageous, but it's uh, an affront to your, your courage, your ethics, your morality in the sport. Why do you think Larry Holmes would say what he said? And, and what do you propose to do about it to deflect any of the criticism? Well, the only thing I can say, I really don't know if Larry Holmes said it, uh, his promoter Bob Aaron said it. Uh, you know, it's unfairly uh, just because uh, don't everybody that knows me know that I haven't used no steroids. I'm a hardworking individual, and I think it hurt the sport to just even bring up anything for it, just hype to hype boxing by bringing something that's negative to steroids. And, uh, and I think it's bad for the kids. And for, because a lot of kids look up to me, and, and it's sad that they would say something like that about me that can reflect the kids who are doing steroids. Do you believe in drug testing for steroids for boxers? Sure. I believe that uh, they, they give us an A test. Why not a steroid test? Why do you think they don't right now? Uh, because it hasn't been an a issue for his, uh, steroid, because it don't help the boxer in no way. Mm -hmm. uh, because if you cannot hit the guy, then what, what good is it going to do? Mm -hmm. is, boxing is built on, you know, ability, being able to outmaneuver your opponent and, and sometimes being able to get a good shot in there to get him out. Right. The Burt Cooper fight, even though you won and you won impressively late, you were almost knocked out. I, I don't know if you'd agree with that, but uh, that was the way it looked. Was it a big disappointment for you, your performance that night? Well, uh, it's not performing that I prefer, but in the game of boxing, you have up and down. And uh, Burt Cooper fought a good fight, 
and he was just able to catch me with a shot that I was trying to catch him with. But the most important thing is I was able to rebound off it and, and was able to take him in the later round. Talk about rebounding. You had a more serious uh, rebounding to do of late. You lost a brother who was shot and killed in Georgia. Um, what, do you, what do you say about a, a young man who, who believed at one point in being part of your life and, in fact, worked with you, and then he got involved with the wrong crowd, and, of course, he lost his life? Um, do you dedicate any part of your, your fight or your career to him? And the bigger question, I guess, has to do with, with young people going the wrong way and, and, and spending a lot of time with people that perhaps they shouldn't be spending time with. Well, you know, I feel um, no doubt that's my brother, and I love my brother. And when he was here, I showed him love and um, I let him be part of um, my program because he was my older brother, and I learned a lot from him. And and just so happened, things like that happened. And, but, you know, life goes on, and I am dedicating this fight to my brother, Willie. Mm -hmm. Other members of your family going to be out there at Vegas uh, Friday night? You have your, your mom out there? And... Well, my mother, my mother going to be home praying. Uh -huh. and, um, and, you know, she, she, she really... Go, does she go to a lot of fights, Evander? In well, not at all. Uh -huh. Not at all. Uh, she, um, she likes to stay home and pray, which is great. And um, she's a heart patient and, and just too much excitement is just not good for her. Do you pray for a win to, to God or do you just pray for your own health? Well, I pray and ask the Lord, give me the strength and the courage to do my very best. As my best is good enough, I will always win. If it's not, then I won't get that decision, but in Harley, I get the win anyway. Do you think the public finally has bought Evander Holyfield as the champ, or do you think you needed the Mike Tyson of the world to, to give you credibility as the undisputed heavyweight champion of the world? Well, I won the championship on October the 25th, 1990. And, you know, that's enough to certify me and give me that self-gratitude that I really worked hard to accomplish something that I really want. And, you know, for as a public, people have their opinion and what they feel that is I'm the undisputed or not, but realistic, the fact is, remain that I am the heavyweight champion of the world, unless they can find someone that's better. You're going to fight and knock out Larry Holmes? Larry Holmes, uh, we just spoke to him. He's going to be joining us in just a few moments. He said he will knock you out. You're going to knock him out? Want to make a prediction? Well, I win the fight. If, if I knock him out, I still won the fight. If I win on the decision, uh, that's good as well, and I still won the fight. Ben Holyfield, you're a quality guy. I've spent some time with you. We've done a lot of charity work together. You're a terrific guy, and we appreciate it. Best of luck to you Friday night against Larry Holmes. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, we'll come back. Larry Holmes joins us, the challenger who was once the champ for seven and a half years. We'll do it after this. Up Close is brought to you by Budweiser, the king of beers, with that clean, crisp, cold taste. Nothing beats a Bud. Roll the film over here. Let's get something going over here. Van the Holyfield, a great champion. Look at that physique, strong. But where is he making a mistake? Look where his hands are. <laughs> he cannot fight me with his hands like that. But you can if I was fighting like that. <laughs> That's Professor Larry Holmes at the press conference. Now he joins us live in Las Vegas, former heavyweight, heavyweight champion of the world. Welcome, Larry. Thank you for joining us. Uh, what were you trying to prove in that press conference? Just for laughs, or were you making a point about uh, Evander Holyfield keeping his hands low? Well, you know, what I was saying was the truth. We do carry his hands kind of low, and you can't fight me like that. Um, I'm just having a whole lot of fun getting ready to knock this guy out and take this title away. That's all. Yeah. There was a quote in the Sports Illustrated article uh, this past week, a big profile about you. I know you saw Rock Newman talking about Larry Holmes and what kind of shape he's in. It read this way. Larry Holmes was washed up six years ago. He's slow as molasses. His jab is not what it used to be. Uh, he packs little, if any, power at this point. That he beat Ray Mercer no is... <laughs> Wait a minute. Let me finish, let me finish this. Have to read no more of that. All right. I don't because, have to read. No, because first of all, these guys, everybody who makes a statement about me right now are jealous. I'm in the position to fight for the title, and I'm going to win the title. Mm -hmm. And when I win the fight, title, I'm not going to fight him. So this is why he's hoping and praying that I can get, that Ray Mercy, get, I mean, this guy, Holyfield, get past me. 
but there's no way it's going to happen, man. So hell with what Rock Newman say, because he's another guy who wants to make a few dollars. So you're not interested in Riddick Bowe at any point? No, I'm not interested in anybody who negatory towards a great fighter like myself, because I fought them all. I done something he didn't do. I fought Ray Mercer. He would not fight Ray Mercer. So what the hell he got to talk about, huh? Mm -hmm. Tell me about what you saw Holyfield and Cooper when uh, apparently Holyfield was, was maybe a punch or two away from being knocked out completely. You know, most definitely, Holyfield gets tired. Everybody knows that. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine rounds, he's tired. And he hangs on for the rest of them if he goes the distance. Uh, most fighters that he fought haven't been in the condition that I'm in. And that's going to be Holyfield's problem. He's fighting a guy who knows how to fight. He's fighting a guy who's been here before. He's, been, he's fighting a guy who's been the champion for seven and a half years. This man knows that he's got a fight. There's no two ways about it. Mm -hmm. And whatever he does to me, I had it done to me before. But the things that I'm going to do to him, he never had them done to him before. Larry, I want to talk a little bit about the Ray Mercer fight for just a moment, because obviously this was the one that changed people's minds that you were in any kind of shape to fight for the heavyweight championship. Uh, Lou Duva just a few moments ago told us that he thought that, that Mercer just fought a dumb fight. He just stood there, and when you talked to him, he talked back, and you nailed him, and you surprised him because he was so inexperienced. Did you fight a guy that maybe we devalued as a contender in Ray Mercer? No, no way. Uh, Ray Mercer was a great fighter. And, you know, the thing about Lou Duva just trying to take away from my credibility. I'm a good fighter. I make these fighters do what I want them to do. And the same thing I'm going to do to Holyfield. Lou cannot help Vander fight. He only can tell him. Okay, if he was so great, if Georgia was so great, why did Mildred Taylor get knocked out out here a couple of weeks ago? Mm -hmm. It shouldn't have never happened. So uh, whatever they say, it's not, it don't really mean anything. When that bell rang, Evander Holyfield's in the ring with just me and the referee. And if the referee don't hurt, help him, he's in trouble. Mm -hmm. Now that sounds pretty ingracious, uh, ungracious for, in some ways to a guy that gave you the chance to get the title back, Evander Holyfield. Do you owe him any gratitude at all, Holyfield? Oh, you listen, I, I appreciate the fact that Evander gave me the opportunity and I'm not taking that lightly. I really appreciate that. I also appreciate the fact that main event, you know, chose me. And they're, they're a great outfit. But, you know, when, you, when the bell rings, you got to do what you got to do. And Lou and the whole Evander Holyfield camp is saying what they want to say to get me off of my key. And that, that's the way they're supposed to do it. But I, I'm used to it. I'm, I'm appreciated that Evander gave me this opportunity. Hey, uh, 1988 four and a half years ago, you were knocked out in four rounds by Mike Tyson. Are you in any way a different, you say perhaps even a better fighter than you were when you were knocked out four years ago? Of course. Uh, you know what I was doing four years ago. Four years ago, I was down there in Atlantic City singing with my band Mama Lady. I was out partying. I was doing this. I was doing that. I was not even thinking of my boxing, but they gave me three million dollars to get ready for Mike Tyson. I had two months to get ready, and so therefore I came in unprepared. But this time, I had 17 months to get ready for this fight. Mm -hmm. So therefore, it's a, a totally different story. Mm -hmm. As we said before, Larry Holmes, a seventh grade dropout, as you might know, but he's With a very- With a PhD in common sense. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm that's a right. boxing executive. The boxing executive, that's right. Well, we, we said this before, <laughs> we'll say it again. He's earned millions in the ring, and of course, he defended his title 20 times in seven years. We'll come back more with Larry in a few moments. We'll talk about being a boxing mercenary, doing it merely for the money, with Larry Holmes from Las Vegas right after this. And uh, Larry Holmes is right. He is a teacher. He's a good teacher. And in my grammar school years, when we had a good teacher, to show our appreciation, we would bring an apple. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> And, um, my apple now? <laughs> and with this apple, I, I do want to give to the, to the best teacher. <laughs> Music Express, voted number one by the National Limousine Association, has offices in Los Angeles and the East Coast. Music Express can handle your corporate needs anywhere in the U.S. and worldwide.
Larry Holmes takes on Evander Holyfield uh, Friday night, uh, June 19th at Caesars Palace for the Heavyweight Championship of the World. Larry, I want to ask you a little bit about the quote that you were associated with for many, many years. I'm only in this for one thing. I'm not in for the title. I'm not in it for the prestige. I'm only in it for the money. Is there anything wrong with that? Who said that? You, according to well, a I'm... number of sources. Well, they, well, they're wrong. First of all, you know, you got to have pride in what you do. And, you know, you, I'm boxing because I have a lot of pride. I love the game of boxing. Of course, I don't want to do it for nothing. I want to get paid when I do it. I demonstrate my talent. I want to get paid because it's a job to, you know, to me. And, um, you know, I, I love the game of boxing. I'm not doing it because I just want to be the champion. I want to be the champion. I want to make the money. I want to make fans around the world. And I want to lead a game, you know, with some, uh, some greatness. Mm -hmm. How much of this is a need? I'm not trying to get big Freudian here with you, a big psychoanalytical view of it, but how much is it a need to be loved and appreciated, Larry? All the years, of course, being a champion for so long, but always viewed in the shadow of Ali and never really being adored in that way, perhaps. What do you think? You know, you work hard for something. You want people to respect you. You want people to love you, you know. You want your mom to love you. It's same like you want everybody to say, hey, Larry, all right, man, you've done a great job. Uh, you know, good luck to you, you know. And, and that's the way I want to feel. I want people to make me feel that way, and I want to make people feel good about themselves. I don't want to take nothing away from nobody. I don't want to take nothing away from Van Holyfield. If he whoops Larry home, I'm going to walk up to him. I'm going to shake his hand and say, man, good luck. If I can do anything to help you, call me up, because that's the kind of guy I am, and I want him to be the same way. Do you have any regrets, Larry, over the years for some of the things you had said and some of the ways you had put it in the Rocky Marciano controversy and a few other things, uh, the, the fans could kiss, kiss me where the sun don't shine, et cetera? Well, you know what? I'm going to tell you something. I feel good about myself, in which I said that many times to people. When somebody hurt me, I want to hurt back. Uh -huh. I haven't, didn't know the Marciano. I'm not been six years ago. Right. Or, and people are still bringing that up. I mean, he's going to hunt me for the rest of my life. What am I supposed to do, apologize now, six mm -hmm. years later? No, I'm going to go on with my life, live happy ever after with my family, do what I got to do to earn a living, and, and just let bygones be bygones. I don't regret too much of anything that I've done because I've done it in jest at that time. I mean, if the circumstance was different now as it was, is, I would not have done that. Do, but, you re uh, do you regret at any point your association with Don King? No. Don King done good for me, you know, early in my boxing career. Uh, he done good for me as I was a champion. We made a deal. We had agreements. We had our ups and downs. With, uh, everybody fuss and fight once in a while. And I don't regret it because it was a learning experience. I'm sure he learned with me. I learned with him. I'm with a different promoter now, Bob Aram, and he's got to get used to me, and I got to get used to him. So we're going to probably fight too. Mm. Larry Holmes will come back more from Las Vegas with Larry after this. Travel arranged through Continental. One airline can make a difference. For the price of unrestricted coach, a first class seat. That's the difference on Continental. Y'all paid a lot of money to see this fight, and y'all gonna see a good fight. So don't be smart, bet on me. Go ahead with it, Firestone. Come on with it. I'm ready now. I'm getting hot. We're talking to Larry Holmes from Las Vegas. He's ready. He's getting hot. I'm ready, man. What are you, what are you hot about? Why are you so fired up? You should be sitting in a rocking chair at 42. Well, you wish you were as young as me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And at 42 years old, you know, I'm like a 32-year-old man. Uh -huh. I mean, because I don't burn that candle at both ends. And I don't do all the things that these young people out here do today. I'm, I train for this fight. I'm ready for this fight, mentally, physically prepared to knock out this man. And when after the fight, they're going to say the new heavyweight champion of the world, Larry Holmes from Eastern PA. Now, this past Friday in Los Angeles, uh, you and the champ, Holyfield, were at a promotional swing through some of the schools down here, talking to kids about staying in school. You, now, we said this before, you're seventh grade dropout, and obviously you're not proud of that, but what do you tell kids about, you know, they see Larry Holmes, he dropped out of school, he made something of himself. How do you tell kids to stay in school if you left at seventh grade? Larry Holmes got lucky. Everybody can't get lucky. And, uh, you know, the best thing you need to do is to stay in school and to get that education. Because if you turn out to be a champion in whatever field you in and you make a lot of money, you need to be able to manage it. And without a proper education, you won't be able to manage. You'll be end up like a lot of athletes 
broke and don't have anything. I got to say that I'm one of the smartest athletes in this whole wide world of sports because I own my own jail cells, own my own federal courthouse building. I got properties around the world, and I'm still financially set for the rest of my life. Now, how many people can say that with that limited amount of education? He owns half of Eastern Pennsylvania. There's no doubt about that. I don't own half of Eastern Pennsylvania. <laughs> I just own a, bit, a little piece of it, okay. a, little, a little bitty piece of it. What about the fact that uh, you have a couple of brothers serving time? And I know that that's a great, hey, great loss know, for you, personally. Hey, you know, it, it, I'm not exempt from that. I mean, it happens to everybody. Something happens to everybody's family. People look at me and say, man, life is a shame. No, it's a shame it happens to everybody because if you do wrong, you're going to get you're gonna get in trouble. And my brother's done wrong. I would like to help him, but it's too bad. They got in trouble, and maybe when they get out of trouble, uh, they'll be okay. But don't just look at my family. Look at everybody's family because everybody has the same kind of problems that I have. Yeah, well, Larry Holmes hopes to give Evander Holyfield problems and trouble on Friday night. That is, that, that is June 19th at the Caesars, Caesars Palace. Larry Holmes, thank you for spending some time with us. Good luck Friday night. Thank you. Okay. We'll come back, wrap things up, up close, right after this. Larry, I'll tell you something, I was watching you up there. You were great up there, I'm telling you, you know, I guarantee you're going to be the class Victor Vitor or Valeridian or something like that. You're going, to, you're going to wind up doing something. I know you're not going to, I know you're not going to be champion, but you're going to be something. You're going to be. We thank the champ, Evander Holyfield, and the challenger, Larry Holmes, for joining us up close. Coming up later on this week, Bobby Valentine tomorrow, also uh, from the Texas Rangers, Kevin Brown, an outstanding pitcher for this year. Skip Carey of the Braves, the broadcast team, joins us on uh, Wednesday. Burt Sugar will have a chance to give us his assessment of what's going to happen Friday night in the fight in Las Vegas. And then Friday, we end up with Tom Hanks, the comedian. And of course, uh, the actor is going to be doing this new movie called A League of Their Own about uh, women's professional baseball. That's all this week on Up Close. We'll see you starting tomorrow. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.